So I was born in Torquay on October the 22nd, 1990, roughly here. Now other people seem to think that they had the best parents in the world, but they're wrong, because I do. Dad was an officer in the Royal Navy, and he worked at the Naval College in Dartmouth, which is where he lived. Mum worked at the Ministry of Defence until I was born, but then she took some years off to look after me before she went back to work and did a couple of jobs. Now, we didn't have a huge amount of money as a family, we didn't go on fancy holidays or have fancy things, but we were happy. I wouldn't have changed it for the world. When I was three, we moved to a village called Coombe Down, just outside of Bath, here, and Dad started working away from home. Now, sometimes this was in London, so we would see him on the weekends, but sometimes he was on ship, which meant we wouldn't see him for weeks or months at a time. So for a lot of my childhood, it was just mum and me, and I was largely influenced by her, which is great because my mum is ace. I learned to love books and reading from her, I learned to love music. The big thing which mum did in her spare time was to sing and to sing opera, so I went to a lot of rehearsals. A lot of rehearsals. And from that I guess I learned to love performance, not just music, but also drama. And from that I got into films. From a really young age I would write scripts and draw contact art and act out scenes from films, but more on that later. I guess the most important thing which mum and dad both gave me was to always be curious and to always ask questions. Neither of my parents went to university, but they're both really intelligent. For as long as I can remember, I was encouraged to learn, to read science books, to watch TV programmes like Natural World and Horizon. I remember going to London and just doing the big museums, not the normal tourist stuff. I bloody loved dinosaurs. So at primary school, I was always the keen one, the one who stuck up his hand to answer the teacher's questions. I was pretty good at most things, but not outstanding at anything. But maths was by far my least favourite subject. I was much more interested in English and history, which I found way easier. I did get bullied a fair bit for being the keen one, but I did have some good friends. One of them was this kid called Charlie McDonnell. He went on to make a YouTube channel called Charlie So Cool Like, and he was actually a pretty big influence later in my life, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. My two best friends were John and Mark. We met in playgroup at age three, and we're still really good friends now at age 24. We went swimming together with our families, but the most important thing we did together was Cubs and then later Scouts. We progressed through the Scout system together for about 10 years, and we picked up lots of new friends on the way, notably two guys called Tom and Theo. The five of us formed a core group that did everything Scouts could offer us. We did gliding, rock climbing, power boating, hiking in Switzerland, canyoneering. We had a pretty awesome Scout group. You name it, we did it. The funny thing is, though, that despite having great friends and the best parents, I remember a lot of my time at primary school being lonely and unhappy. I read a bunch of my old school reports recently which said that I was a happy child, but maybe that was just a performance I'd already started. Or maybe my memory's being selective. Things definitely started looking at when I started going to my secondary school. We moved all of eight miles from Coondown to a town called Kainsham, partly to be close to my elderly paternal grandparents and partly to get into the catchment area for Wellsway School. My parents and I had looked around a whole bunch of schools in the area and they decided that they liked the look of Wellsway the best. I was actually later told by my parents that they could have afforded to send me to private school or supported me through uni, and they basically gambled that I'd be clever. So they sent me to Wellsway, which was a state comprehensive. Studying more seriously there suited me right down to the ground, and I started being really good at English and science in particular, but towards the top of the class in, in pretty much everything. Except maths. I was still really bad at that. Though just about in the top set. I also started getting involved in some extracurricular drama, music, I started playing the alto saxophone, and I threw the discus at county level. The disadvantage of going to World's Way was that I knew no one there. I was the only one from my primary school to go. And I got to know some of my tutor group really well, and I became good friends with David and Michael, who I walked to school with every day, they lived on my road. And it helped that we all played in Collective Warhammer. For the Emperor! But my best friend was, and is, John. We met in a situation straight out of a Nicholas Sparks novel. In year 8 we did a house rugby tournament, and this lanky ginger kid got crunched in a tackle, and laid out on the touchline. Play carried on, and it was winter, so this guy began to freeze, and he went blue and then purple. I wasn't playing, so I went up to him and gave him my blazer, and I helped him up to the school nurse so he could warm up. Because of that, we started sitting together in German, we bonded over marking test scores in Roman numerals, then GCSE history, and then we just kept going. I love him, he's like the brother I never had. But anyway, getting distracted. Now, in year 10, normally kids in my school went on two weeks of work experience at local companies. But I didn't end up doing this because as part of a team from my school, I won a national competition to design a new invention to be used in space. We designed a tent which would be used on the surface of the moon, with the imaginatively named Team Space Tent, and generated a breathable atmosphere for the astronauts inside. 
Winning the competition meant we spent two weeks in America touring the Johnson and Kennedy Space Centers, which was absolutely awesome. Not least because we got to see the Space Shuttle land. At GCSE, I got the top results in my school, only because I seemed to do more subjects than anyone else. More than the school would even let me do. I couldn't decide between GCSE history and geography, as was required by the option blocks, so I just decided to do geography in my spare time. This meant that I ended up doing 11 GCSEs, and I got 9 A-stars and 2 A's, with the 2 A's being in double computing, and they... A's plague me to this day. It was in my GCSEs that I decided I really liked physics and I wanted to go on to uni and study it. I realised when science split into biology, chemistry and physics that all the cool stuff was in physics, so that was what I liked. So I chose my A-levels accordingly, I did maths, further maths, physics and geography. Now my maths teacher, who was an absolutely inspirational woman called Miss Skirm, thought that further maths was a step too far for me. I'd scraped an A-star in GCSE maths, which she also didn't think I could do, and so she reluctantly let me take further maths. The subject, particularly the statistics and the pure stuff, really pushed me. But sixth one was when I really came into my own. I was elected head boy, I captained the school debate team, won awards for public speaking, played mixed and men's hockey, went on expeditions to the Alps and to the Pyrenees, and somehow I also got into Oxford. I applied to Oxford, Durham, Manchester, Leeds and Warwick, and all for physics, and I managed to get offers from them all, despite having my Manchester interview sprung on me and not even going to my Durham interview. But Oxford was the one that I really cared about. A big influence on me applying was going on the unique summer school. I stayed in Magdalen College for a week and loved every bit of it. It was the first time that I thought maybe I could get in. So I applied to Jesus College and that was partly decided by looking at the research the physics teachers did, which incidentally is a dumb idea. Don't choose a college like that. And I basically chose it because it felt like home when I walked around. That, incidentally, is a much better way of choosing. I went up for, I think, three days of interviews in Oxford, three interviews at Jesus and one at St Peter's, which was the randomly allocated college that I was given when I arrived. They all went pretty well, though my maths interview at Jesus was one of the scariest things I've ever done. As it turns out, though, Jesus was very oversubscribed for physics, and I just missed out on a place there. Fortunately, however, St Peter's were very happy to take me. Finding out that I got in was one of the happiest moments of my life, though also one of the most stunned. In a sense, it was a huge relief. Even though I'd always told myself that I probably wasn't going to get in, I knew that I was going to be really disappointed in myself if I didn't. I also didn't want to let my teachers or my parents down. As it was, I remember how happy Mum and Dad were. Dad shook my hand and I knew for sure for one of the only times that he was really proud of me. Of course, I still had to meet my 3A offer, this was before A-stars were a thing, and in the end I got A's across the board, as well as passing an open university module on planets I took and getting one of the first ever A-stars in a trial for the extended project, which I did on manned missions to Mars. So I became the first member of my family to go to university, and the first in my school to go to Oxford for physics. Wellesway actually had a great year for Oxbridge admissions, and instead of sending the normal one or two, we sent four people to Oxford and Cambridge. I was really good friends with them all, and I have no doubt that we all spurred each other on to success. Particularly my friend Chris, who graduated from Merton College, Oxford, with a disgustingly high first, and is to this day the smartest person I've ever met. Going to uni is one of those big changes in life, like every TV show and film tells you that you step into adulthood and you become who you are at uni. And I only really realised the significance of what was going to happen the night before I left, when I was lying in bed looking at all the bags packed on my floor, and I realised I wasn't going to be sleeping in my room anymore. Adjusting to Oxford life was simultaneously easy and tough. I was made to feel so welcome by everybody in St Peter's, it really is the friendliest college, and instantly fell at home. So that was easy. The hard part was dealing with the work. I'd always told myself that I was going to be at the bottom of the pack of physicists, that I wasn't good enough to be there. And that, to counteract this, I should work as hard and as constantly as I could. I'd work 60 hour weeks and do nothing but work and see my girlfriend, who studied three hours away in Cambridge on the weekends. Nothing else. It was only at the end of my first year that I started to play in the university wind band, and to be honest, I think that saved me. It gave me something else to do, an opportunity to not feel like crap about myself, and a chance to make music. Because the thing about working all the time like I did is that it doesn't work. Without something else to anchor your life around, everything slows down, and you end up accomplishing less than if you'd allocated half the time and then done something else in your free time. Because of this, I didn't do so great in first year. Admittedly, a third of the year failed, but I take full responsibility for my personal failure. That summer I stayed in Oxford and I revised, and in my resits I got just under a first. And doing that was really significant for me, I felt like I'd beat my personal demon. 
things started looking up from there. In my second year, I became the manager of my wind band, and I took part in and won the departmental public speaking competition. I also took the teaching physics in schools option, and I won the department award for that too. I even got a practical commendation for work in the lab. I got a good 2-1 in second year, and had loads of enthusiasm for going into third year. I loved the range of modules, from particle physics to general relativity, and in the end of year exams I got just a hair's breadth under a first. And then it all went wrong. After I took my third year exams, in the space of a weekend, my childhood pet, our beautiful cat Henry, died, and my girlfriend of three years left me. I was absolutely devastated. I was faced with a summer of no work and no girlfriend, and basically my life from the past three years had vanished and I had to rebuild who I was, because I'd made the mistake of only doing two things, and I hadn't diversified my interests. That summer, I was very lucky to get an internship at the Atmospheric Physics Department in Oxford, which I took to work out if a PhD was for me. As a student on a four-year course, I only started to think about my career after my third year. And the internship was fantastic for that. It was a good routine to get into, it was a chance to learn new things, and some time by myself. It was also important because I became okay with who I was. And I mostly did that and I got some good work done. But while I was okay over the summer, when term started again in October, things got worse. While I did start to socialise more in college and even took a few classes on meditation and yoga, I still worked far too hard and I didn't give myself enough personal time. As the year went on, I became really seriously unhappy. I don't think people realised at the time because I'm very good at putting a brave face on things and not being honest with my emotions. But I also wasn't honest with myself about my situation. I suppose I didn't want to admit that I was struggling because to do so would have been to admit a weakness. I was still functioning though, and just about got my problem sheets in, though I seriously struggled to see my day in the life video for that example, and I applied for some PhDs. I was offered places at Oxford and Reading and I was over the moon to accept my place at Oxford with a three year scholarship at Oriel dependent on me getting a 2, 1 or above at my degree. I was riding on a good 2, 1 and I felt confident that no matter what happened I should still get one overall. However, my depression was starting to get out of control. In the run-up to my exams, I found myself locking myself in cupboards in the library and just crying, sometimes for over an hour. I just didn't know what to do, I couldn't understand what was happening to me. It all culminated when a few days before my exams I had a full-blown panic attack. At first I thought it was a heart attack, but upon googling symptoms of panic attack, I realised what was going on. It seriously shoot me up, I, I genuinely felt like knowledge had tumbled out of my head and it made me feel like crap. The logical thing to do here, of course, would have been to tell someone and ask to defer my exams, maybe. It was obvious that I was in no fit state to do them, but I didn't. I hinted to a few friends that I was struggling and I just carried on. I was just too proud to ask for help. The days before I finished my exams were the darkest of my life. I barely slept, I worked all day on things I didn't understand, and I started to hate myself so much that I would cut myself. It was horrible. But I did it, and I'm not sure why. Of course, I did terribly in my exams, but passed them both, which meant that I still got a degree. Now, the requirement to get a 2-1 is to achieve a 59.5% average overall. What I got was 59.45%. My PhD supervisor told me that she didn't care and that she would take me to the department to get me my scholarship anyway, but they flatly refused, and they pulled my funding. I later found out that she was absolutely furious about this and made a formal complaint to the university. By the biggest stroke of luck possible though, while this was all happening, she was at a conference and she mentioned to a colleague the situation. And this colleague had a career integration grant from the EU and could take on PhD students while he was in the maths department at Exeter. We exchanged emails, the college okayed it and I got my place here. From this point, everything started looking up. I moved down to Exeter and I threw myself into student life. I took courses on advanced maths and I started doing some original if for now, guided research. I started lifting weights seriously and I got myself in shape. I joined the Acapella Society because I thought that one of the musical directors was fit and knew lots about gaming and we've been going out ever since. I've been busy around the clock with so many different things and I'm incredibly lucky to have the friends I have. I moved into a house with three guys from the department and I get to sing almost every day with some of the best people I know, including my girlfriend. But there's a big element of this story missing. What about YouTube? I hear you cry. When I applied to Oxford, I tried to find out information about student life by all possible means, and one of the things I did was, of course, to search on YouTube. 
but I turned up nothing. At that time, only the Sai Business School had a channel. Instead, the most useful thing I found was talking very briefly and via email to someone who did physics via a mutual friend. The personal, honest depiction of student life really reassured me, and it meant I had no qualms at all about accepting my offer. After spending a few months at Oxford, I realised that I had a really valuable perspective, not just as somebody on the course, but also having talked to the admissions tutors. So I made a video. I used my terrible 4 megapixel camera and I edited it on a machine at the university computing department because I didn't own any editing software. I uploaded it to my channel and I watched as its views crept up one by one. When I hit 100 views I was so happy I thought I'd really hit it big. So I decided to make more videos, seeing that people were benefiting from the first one, and I went for my interview questions, and I did a Q&A, and an FAQ, and a video on studying, and people somehow kept watching. Eventually, I went to St Peter's and said that they should make a YouTube channel because what I was doing was working, and they said, okay, you make it. So I did. Originally, it was only going to be interviews with a few people, that honest student perspective I talked about, but it soon grew into something much bigger. It went live in 2011, and it changed how many colleges do their access work. Building on its success and trying to find something to do with myself in my fourth year, I hit on the idea of making weekly vlogs to give an honest student perspective on Oxford life, and the Oxblog project was born. It started slowly, but especially after I was joined by Jamie, aka Jamie Mills, it grew in size, and by the year's end it had amassed hundreds and thousands of fans. I pushed the university to continue the project the next year as a collaboration between undergraduates from across the university, but there wasn't much interest. So I created the channel myself and I recruited five amazing students who went on to get over 100,000 views and a devoted following. This year we have six students who will take the project even further and I'm confident they're going to blaze a trail that universities across the world will follow. So now I'm at an interesting crossroads. I've always imagined that I would finish my PhD, I'd do a postdoc and I'd continue down that path as an academic. But now I've done so much media production, hundreds of videos, all told, as well as radio and journalism, I find myself drawn down another path. The idea of producing scientific video content, whether in an online format, like SciShow or Crash Course, or on TV, is a very appealing one. After my doctorate, I'll need to make a choice to go down one path or the other, and right now I honestly don't know which I'll choose. Maybe I'll go down a third path. I've been increasingly thinking about maybe directing a short film these days. I'm at a really exciting position in my life, where I have an awful lot of opportunities presented to me. And I'm incredibly grateful for this amazing online community which has sprung up around the videos which I've done and I know no matter what I choose to do in the future will support and be there for me.